misunderstood the savior of sinners hung on the cross he was god's only son oh hear him call his father in heaven let not my will but thine be done oh when i come to the end of my journey weary of life and the battle is won carrying the cross and the cross of redemption he'll understand and say well done it's a powerful chorus and verse there Jesus Christ was misunderstood, the savior of sinners. But I like the final part there. He says he'll understand after we've gone through this life and he'll say, well done. We misunderstand each other, but Jesus understands us. He knows who we are and what we're about. I want you to go back with me. Take your imaginations back. And think about the cross. On the day that Jesus Christ was crucified, in the Middle East, it had to be a hot day, probably 90 to 100 degrees. He had been battered and bruised, back opened up, legs beaten, sun bearing down. And I bet even those who stood around the cross of Jesus Christ said, this is a horrible scene that I'm looking at right now. People standing in the heat see a man battered and bruised and a man laid down on a wooden plank, the cross. And in the heat of the day, they all of a sudden hear. And they nail the nails in his hand. And then they hear, and they nail the nails in his feet. And all the people that stand around the cross, at the foot of the cross were those who had accused Jesus. At the foot of the cross were those who followed him. At the foot of the cross was his family. And at the foot of the cross, were the soldiers that had been there, that were there to make sure that everything went according to plan. At the foot of the cross. They all must have been very startled when this man that was hanging on the cross in the hot sun, in the heat, no shade, barely clothed, and he says some final words, and he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani. Some thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah, but they misunderstood. Had they known the scriptures, they would have known that he was speaking from the 22nd Psalm, which talks about the death of the Messiah, had they known the scriptures. What he actually was saying in, in Greek and in Hebrew was, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? There are many prophecies in the Old Testament that deal with the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the one in Psalms 22, it's one of the most graphic. And I want you to look at this with me this morning. The reason why we're here. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, commit thyself unto Jehovah. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him seeing he delights in him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. 
My heart is like wax. It is melted within me, for dogs have compassed me. A company of evildoers have enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I may count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They part my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. As much as Jesus had talked about the fact that he was going to be put to death and that he would hang on a cross, isn't it strange that these people didn't realize that this was the fulfillment of prophecy? Isn't it strange? But they didn't understand. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, Herod was convinced that he was the one that was going to challenge him over his rulership, but Herod didn't understand. Jesus spoke of his resurrection many times in the book of John, chapter 2, verse 19. He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll build it up. But they thought that he was speaking of the temple in Jerusalem, not his body. They misunderstood what Jesus was talking about. And there are many other areas in the life of Jesus that people misunderstand. So today, I want to take time to look at the things that they misunderstood what Jesus said. Number one, they misunderstood his miracles. They misunderstood his miracles. They thought that his miracles were done for show or maybe to grab power. The story is told in Matthew chapter 12, verses 23 through 24, about a man. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and who was brought to him, and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. They misunderstood. If they had known like Nicodemus had known, what was going on, they would have understood. You see, but they misunderstood the source of Jesus' power. In John chapter 3, verse 2, it says, The same came to him by night, Nicodemus, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no one can do the signs that thou do except God be with him. They misunderstood where his power came from. They misunderstood the purpose of his miracles. In Matthew chapter 12, it says, Then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we would see a sign from thee. We want a sign from you, Jesus, to know, to tell us that you are the Messiah that has come. You see, but this entire account shows that they really didn't want a sign, the Sadducees and Pharisees and the scribes. They wanted to trip Jesus up. They wanted to find something that he would say or do that they could condemn him for. They didn't really want to see a sign. They misunderstood the purpose. The miracles of Jesus are still misunderstood today. You have people all over saying, I want a miracle in my life. I want a miracle. But many people today have no better concept of miracles than those Jews did in the first century. It says in Mark, and they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word by the signs that followed. Miracles were performed to confirm the word, to say that this is true what Jesus is speaking about. But they misunderstood. 
and people still misunderstand today. They want signs and symbols. But the signs weren't just for the reason of giving signs. They were to confirm the word. The gospel of Christ was to be preached to all nations. But how would the people know that this word was from God? Because they didn't have the written word. How would they know? Hebrews 2, 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which having at the first been spoken through the Lord was confirmed to us by them that heard. God also bearing witness with them, both by signs and wonders and the manifold powers and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. That's how people were to know. Because God had provided signs and wonders so that the word could be firmed up. Some people want miracles today. But God stated that miracles are written that you might believe. Look at what he says here. He says here in 1 Corinthians, and it's very important because as we get to 1 Corinthians 13, you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he talks about all the miraculous gifts, the gifts of prophecy, the gifts of healing, the gifts of speaking in tongues. And people want signs today, and they want to speak in tongues, and they want to heal people, and they want all these things to happen. But the Word of God says it's been confirmed. This is the reason why you have miracles. But then he says in verse uh, chapter 13 that these are only to be temporary. He says here, but these are written, excuse me, I'm looking at the wrong verse here. He says, lost my ends and by the prophecy they will cease. Love never ends and never fails, but prophecies they will cease. He says, tongues will cease. And he says, all of the knowledge, that, that miraculous knowledge, they will cease. When will it cease? Because it was imperfect. And we're going to tie that into James chapter 1 in just a second. He says, all this was imperfect. He says, but when that which is perfect shall come, then that which is imperfect shall be done away with. You see, the prophecies and the healings and the signs were imperfect. That perfect there, I highlighted the word perfect. It's a unique word because it's the word teleos in Greek. And what it means is it's a thing that's coming. You see, in Greek you have, you have a male gender that you speak about and you have a female gender that you speak about and then you have a neuter gender. Now, I know today we have problems with gender. People can... I won't go there. The lesson's not on that. But when the Greek was written, it said male gender, female gender. That means it was a person. Neuter gender means it's a thing. So he's saying when that perfect thing has come, then the imperfect will be done away with. So it's not when Jesus comes back again. It's when the perfect has come. And that's where you go in James chapter 1. He says, he that looks into the perfect law of liberty. The law, the perfect law. You see, the first law wasn't perfect. That's why Christ had to come to fulfill it. And so he talks about this. And the perfect law is the word. And so the miracles were confirmed, would confirm the word. So do we need miracles? Yes. Do we have miracles? Yes, they're written in the word. Some people want miracles today, but the word of God says in, in 1 John chapter 20, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Did you know that Jesus did other works and wonders and miracles that you don't even find in the word of God? He did. And he says, if all of them were written, you wouldn't have enough books to fill the shelves. 
He said, but these, what? These that are written in the Word of God, the Bible, are written that you may believe. We do have miracles. They're in the Word of God. And I believe every miracle in the Word of God, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. I believe in miracles because they're written down in the Word of God. They misunderstood his gospel. Many of the Jews felt that the gospel of Jesus Christ was some sort of addition to the Jewish religion. And in fact, they called it a sect in Acts chapter 28, that sect. They thought it was just another form of Judaism that was coming along. But Acts chapter 24 gives us a different story. He says, but this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call a sect, I serve God of our fathers, believing all things that which are according to the law, which are written in the prophets. They called it a sect. Today, we call them denominations. Same thing. Jesus was showing his followers that they were not a sect of the Jews, and he promised he would fulfill the law. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. I have come, the law of the prophets, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill them. The law was there, an imperfect law, and Jesus came to fulfill the law because no one else could fulfill the law. None of us could live a perfect life. But guess who can? Jesus Christ. He said, I come to fulfill the law. And then he talks about in Colossians 2 and 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, the law, this is set aside, nailing it to the cross. I like the word debt there. There's a song we sing, we, he paid a debt we could not owe. That's what we just sang. There was a debt in that old law that we could not pay, and only one person could pay it, and that was Jesus Christ. And he paid the debt, so the law was no longer needed. Galatians 5 and 4 says, you are severed from Christ. What does severed mean? To be cut away. Ye who would be justified by the law. You are fallen away from grace. If you want to hold to the old law, you are severed from Christ. The law is no longer needed. The Apostle Paul wrote all of this to validate that they could understand what the gospel was. Some misunderstood the purpose of the gospel. Not only did they misunderstand the gospel, they misunderstood the purpose of the gospel. Many thought that Jesus came to make a better world. They thought that Jesus came to help society and to make a better society. They thought that Jesus came to help the needy. They thought that Jesus came to correct injustices. And I hope you don't misunderstand me right now. Jesus didn't come for that reason. The purpose of the gospel is quite different than what people say it is today. There's a commercial I see on television every now and then. You see these, these young men that are dressed up, uh, dressed down, I guess you would say, and they're sitting on the stoop, and, and they run up the street, and they say, Jesus gets us. Jesus gets us. Jesus knows us. It's for us to get Jesus. It's not for him to get us. You see, Obedience is what drives us to Jesus. But Jesus didn't come to cure all the ills of the world. It says here in Matthew chapter 10, verses 35 and 36, For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus didn't come to give peace in that sense, a cessation of war or anger and things such as that. 
Jesus didn't come for that. For Jesus, in, in Luke 21, he says, But when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not terrified, but these things must come. Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars. Families will argue. Things will be bad in this world. Jesus didn't come to cure the ills of the world. In John chapter 12, verse 8, for the poor you have with you always, but you do not have me always. What is Jesus saying? I didn't come to cure poverty. You will always have the poor with you. There will always be someone in need. Jesus didn't come to cure poverty. In 2 Timothy 3 and 12, Yea, and all that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus didn't come to get rid of persecution. He didn't come to cure the, e the ills of the world. But that raises a question. If he didn't come to stop wars, if he didn't come to mend families, if he didn't come to get rid of the poor, then why did Jesus come? Why? The Bible has an answer. In Luke 19 and 10, for the Son of Man came to do what? To seek and to save that which is lost. There was somebody that was lost. Long ago, I was lost. And Jesus came seeking for me. There's a song I love to sing, seeking for me. Jesus came seeking for you. All of you that are sitting here this morning, you've been baptized into his body. Jesus came for you. 1 Timothy 1 and 15, faithful is the saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners of who I am the chief. That's why Jesus Christ came. He didn't come to get rid of poverty. He didn't come to cease wars. He came because you and I were lost in our sins and we needed a savior. The purpose of the gospel, that's the purpose. Now we may care for the poor, we may help stop wars, we may do all those things, but those are byproducts of us accepting Jesus Christ and living a life like him. Following the teachings of Christ will make for a better life, but the gospel's primary purpose is to prepare us for eternity. That's the primary purpose. They misunderstood his church. The church with Jesus Christ built had its beginnings in Jerusalem seven weeks after the death of Jesus. It's important when we look at this. It says in Isaiah 2, he says, It will come about in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established on the highest mountains, and he will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream unto it. Many groups of people will come, coming, come, let us go unto the temple of God of Jacob, that they may teach us his ways. God was going to build his church. Jesus was going to build his his church. Matthew 16 says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The rock is not Peter. The rock is the statement that Peter made when he said, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the statement. And he says, Peter, upon this rock, this statement, this confession that you have made, I will build my church. He talks about that. In Luke 24 and 26, and he said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Talking to the apostles and his followers. And they stayed in Jerusalem. And then in Acts chapter 2, it's too much to put on here, but in Acts chapter 2, you have the fruition of that coming. 
And after, after the apostle had preached the gospel, Peter, they said, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. They misunderstood his church. Jesus said, I will build my church. I love that because that my is a personal pronoun. He said, this is my church, Jesus' church. But they misunderstood Many today misunderstand his church. Many think of the church as a denomination or sect. But Christ's church is no more denomination today as it was in the days of Jesus. The church of Christ was built by Jesus, Matthew 16, 18. We just saw that. He bought it with his own blood in Acts chapter 20. He will save the church, Acts chapter 2 and 47 in Colossians. He's coming back to save the church, his church. The church is the body of Christ in Colossians 1, 18. The church is his kingdom. And finally, the church is his bride. I love that because when I became a member of the body of Christ, I was stuck on a few things, and it was related to me that the church is the bride of Christ, and Christ only has one bride. If he has more than one bride, he would be an adulterer. And he couldn't be the savior. Jesus Christ, they misunderstood him. We often hear people, as they argue today, all churches belong to Jesus Christ. They're all part of his church. But that belies their misunderstanding. For in John chapter 17, now, if you read John chapter 17, people uh, talk about the Lord's Prayer as being the Lord's Prayer. That's, that's a model prayer. But John chapter 17 is truly the Lord's Prayer. This is where he's praying for his followers. And it says there, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, and they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me. I don't know if you realize that I highlighted there. How many times he used the word one? Five times. He wants all of those who profess to be Christians to be one. And if you look out into the denominational world today, you know that's not true. If you're honest, you know that that's not true. The church of Christ belongs to Jesus Christ, and he wants us all to be one. And the most important part, I didn't highlight it there, it says, why does he want us to be one? So that the world may know that you sent me. Wouldn't it say a statement to the world if everyone who professes to know Jesus Christ said we are all one, no divisions among us? That would make a statement to the world. But the statement that the religious community makes to the world is we're all divided. But we must stand as one. As I get ready to close, they misunderstood his baptism. Jesus said in, Matthew, in, in, in Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. I was never good in English. In fact, when I was in college, Renette can tell you this, I had to take a remedial English class. I was never good in English. But I do know a conjunction when I see it. He says there, he that believes and is. That's a conjunction. That means you have to have both of these together to get the finality that you need. Baptism, belief, must be together to be saved. You can't separate it. The world has separated it. The world that says you can believe and be saved. Then there's others that say you just have to be baptized. Well, I don't care what you believe. 
That doesn't give you salvation. Jesus said, belief and baptism saves you. And even on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they said, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? He said, believe and be baptized. And if you look at all the conversions in the book of Acts, you will see belief is in every one. Baptism is in every one. So we must speak where the Bible is speaking, and we must be silent where the Bible is silent. They misunderstood his baptism. Romans 6 and 3. Are ye all ignorant that we all who, uh, are, are, who have been baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We emulate the death of Jesus Christ when we are baptized. Galatians 3 and 26. For ye are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as have been uh, baptized into Christ have put on Christ. A lot of people today don't want to wear Christ. They don't want to put on Christ. But it says if you've been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. You are clothed in Christ. That's what baptism does. But they misunderstood. The baptism of Jesus is not meant to take people from one church to another. It's meant to save sinners. It's not meant to change churches. But they misunderstand. And finally, we should never make the mistake of misunderstanding Jesus Christ. We who are here this morning, majority of us are believers, are Christians. But you know, we can be mistaken sometimes. So we should never make the mistake of misunderstanding Jesus. Let all of us determine as we search the scriptures daily, as William was talking about this morning, that we learn the truth that makes us free in Christ. So I admonish each and every one of you that when Bible study begins at 930, you be here so that we can search the scriptures and learn how we can become more like Christ. Let us constantly apply ourselves to the word of God that we may become all that we ought to be and should be for Jesus Christ. Always being careful to heed what Ephesians 4, excuse me, Ephesians 5, 17 says. Wherefore, be ye not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. None of us wants to be called a fool. And if we don't want to be called a fool, we must learn what the Bible says and live according to the will of God. It is a pleasure and a privilege to stand before you this morning to know that God has brought us all together. And I know that if you look back over your life, as I look back over my life many times, and I see where God has brought me from, Aren't we blessed to be saved? We really are. But many people misunderstood Jesus, and he died for those misunderstandings. But he died to save us, and I'm thankful for that. There may be someone here that needs to put on Christ in baptism. I don't want you to misunderstand this. The invitation is not just coming after a sermon. The invitation is always open. As you study with people this week, the invitation is always there to be added to the body of Christ. It is not a prerequisite to wait until the Lord's day and to come forward before a congregation of people to accept Jesus Christ. The invitation is always there. There may be someone here that has been in the body of Christ, but maybe you struggled with life, and maybe there are some things that have caused problems in your life, and you just struggle with it, and you've somehow gone beyond what Christ would have you to go beyond. You can repent. Don't misunderstand Jesus. He says, repent and come back, and you'll be all right. If there's anyone that meets those two criteria, whether in the body or out of the body, you can come forward now as we stand and as we sing.
Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 